All right, James chapter 2. James chapter 2. Here we go. Uh, Verse 1, we'll go this way today. Is that all right? You okay to do verse 2? All right. My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of mercy. Two, suppose a man comes into your meeting uh, wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and, and a poor man in shabby clothes also comes in. Three, if you show special attention to the man wearing the fine clothes and say, here, a uh, good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there or sit on the floor by my feet. Four, have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Five, (laughs) hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to them that love him. Six, but you have insulted the poor. Is not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Seven, are you they not the ones who are slandering the noble name of him to whom you belong? Eight, if you really keep the royal law found in scripture, Love your neighbor as yourself, and are doing right. Verse 9, but if you show partiality, excuse me, you commit sin, and are committed, wait a minute, and are convicted by the law as transgressors. 10, for whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. 11. For he who said, you shall not commit adultery, also said, you shall not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but you do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. (coughs) Uh, 12. So speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. 13. For judgment without mercy to one who has shown... Uh, For judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Mm -hmm. 14. What good is it, my brothers, if a man uh, uh, claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith give him, can save him? 15. Uh, No, yeah, go ahead. Go, I wish, I wish you well. Keep warm and well fed. 15. Suppose a brother or sister is without clothing and daily food. 16. If one of you says to him, Go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs, what good is it? Mm-hmm. 17. <laughs> Even so, they, if it have not works, is dead again <clears throat> alone. 18, but someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by what I do. 19, you believe that there is one God, good. Even the demons believe that, and should. 20, you foolish man, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works? when he offered Isaac his son on the altar. 22. You see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. 23. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness, Mm -hmm. and he was called God's friend. 24. You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. 25. And in the same way was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? 26. As the body without a spirit is dead, so faith without deed is dead. Mm -hmm. All right. So... Uh, no real characters, because this isn't character literature, right? 
there are examples of people, right? But this isn't a storytelling section. This is a letter. This is teaching or didactic, right? Uh, and James will handle topics, and he'll go through a bunch of different topics. This one, this chapter, a lot of them seem to hang together. The previous chapter, he kind of did some, some surgical strikes about this topic, this topic, this topic. Uh, and in that sense, James is very similar to the Proverbs in the Old Testament. So, uh, Proverbs, skill in the art of godly living. James said last week, if you lack wisdom, ask God and He'll give it to you generously. Where we find wisdom, ultimately it's in the Word. Okay? It's not in navel-gazing, it's not in uh, Einstein, although Einstein was smart. But godly wisdom is, uh, is given out by God through His Word. Those are the ordinary ways that God... Conveys his grace to his people. All right, so uh, I look at this, and again, my I work off this thing where I print stuff that doesn't have any notes. And he dawned on me a while ago. You all have chapter subheadings, so uh, if you were to say how many, and your chapter headings might help you with this, how many different topics, different broad topics, does he take up in chapter two? If you were to just Give it a give it a whirl. I have two. <laughs> According to my <laughs> mine has two two headings. Okay, so what are the divisions that you all have then? The first one is favoritism forbidden. Okay. And the second one is faith and deeds. Okay, and then and the second one probably starts in verse ten. Fourteen. 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 Okay. Okay. Anybody else got any other uh, any other ways that your Bibles have split it up? Uh, as I was just reading through it, you know, and again, I don't have, again, the chapter headings are helpful, but they're also not, if you get the, the Greek version of the book of James, and it says uh, between verse 1 and verse 2, there's not going to be a little thing there that says trials and temptations, right? Or whatever your headings are, right? They're helpful, but James didn't write our, our, little, our little chapter heading, our little paragraph headings. The editors of the Bibles did, right? I'm not saying they're wrong, I'm just saying, okay? So I've got, I've got basically kind of three. One is the partiality or favoritism, and then from 10 to 13 is about um, the law or doing the law, Then from 14 to 26 is faith and works. So it's essentially the same. I've got just a little extra thing in there, all right? Uh, so the first section here, 1 to 9, he talks about partiality. Partiality. And what's the example he uses? Rich man. Rich man. And a poor man. And a poor man. Rich and poor. Um, so he says there in 2, if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in. So he's setting up this this uh, scenario, which isn't probably that outlandish of a scenario, right? He's, he's not making up a ridiculous example. He's making up probably a very common example. And there's a little bit of discussion on whether or not, it says, comes into your assembly there in verse 2. What, is, what does anybody else have there for that assembly? Meeting? Meeting. Okay. Yeah. There's a little bit of a discussion on whether or not James is saying, this is a church meeting. Or this is kind of a specialized meeting where, um, where the, a community has come together to judge a case. Okay, But at the end of the day, it doesn't matter because James is getting at favoritism to, toward the rich or unfavoritism toward the poor. Okay, I would have no problem with saying, you know, if I were going to preach this, I'd say, you know, we're in the... We're downstairs on Sunday morning, and this guy comes in dressed in a tux, and everybody fawns over him. And a guy comes in in shorts and flip-flops and a see-through shirt, and everybody runs away from him, right? Because that's the illustration. That's what he's getting at. And uh, so there in verse 3, if the one who wears the fine clothing, you, everybody runs up to him and says, oh, let us get you to the best seat in the worship space. <laughs> And then the poor man with the flip-flops say, ah, you know, we've got this nursery 
room down here. <laughs> and we've, we've at time run a speaker in there so you can kind of hear, sort of. See what it, see what it's getting at? That's what James is getting this at. This is so disgusting. <laughs> it is. It is. Stand I've over here. I've never seen that happen in a, any church I've ever been in. No, it, it, and it's, you know, we, and that's because the church has read the book of James, right? Probably. And we have tried to tamp that down. And we might, and, and it is it's this way with all of God's law. You can kind of tamp it down where people outside of you can't tell that you're breaking it. But if God's got his x-ray vision and he can see your heart, ooh, it's a different story, right? right. Mm -hmm. But, um, and, and there's also, um, you know, when you're, when you're thinking through this stuff, there's also a difference between, um, there's also a right biblical category of honoring somebody as well, right? Um, so our, uh, when, when Saul Huber comes or when Mr. Mapendi comes, we don't say, would you please sit in the, in the back, right? Or if we were having a potluck, we would rightly uh, say, go ahead, Saul, go ahead, <coughs> Paul, Saul and Paul. <laughs> go ahead, Paul, go to the front of the line. So there is a biblical category of showing somebody the honor that is right. But then that's not what James is getting at. James is not allergic to probably honoring people to whom it is due honor. He's saying... We fawn over. We can fawn over people who are rich just because they're rich. You know what I had trouble with at one time was men coming into church wearing their hats. Years ago, you never saw that, but now you see it a lot. Oh yeah, right here, right now. But, but we are upstairs, to be fair. Well, it depends on the. Like uh, the Missouri Synod, I mean, they are so strict in their beliefs. Well, that's what you, I was. You, you can't do that stuff. Yeah. Were you Missouri or Wisconsin? Missouri. Okay. Wisconsin's pretty stout, too. Oh, Wisconsin <laughs> is worse. <laughs> yeah. Well, and that is, but, but that is a, so, so there was a time when it was societally frowned upon for somebody, for a man to wear a hat in church. Why is that? I think out of respect. Because women wore hats. <laughs> women wear more hats. Yeah, yeah. 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 the, the, hats, like the women wore hats, wore hats and the men were not supposed to. Right. I didn't know yeah. right. I wonder why. Yeah. Well, yeah. I think it was. Does anybody know why? To cover their hair. Well, I mean, I, and it, to be as as generous to that as possible. There is there is a thing where Paul talks about. Uh, a man, it's a shame for him to pray with his head covered, right? Oh, yeah. Now, was when Paul wrote that down, was he saying that in 1940 a man shouldn't come to church wearing a fedora and pray with his with his hat on? I'm not sure, right? But that's probably where that gets traced to. And by the same token, um, there is a there is in Paul something about women having a covering as well. Right. Yeah. All right. So to be you know, pastorally generous, it's not, you know, complete, it wasn't like somebody just pulled it out of the air and said, okay, men, take off your hats when you come inside. I mean, now, in a house, it's a different story, right? Like, even if you wanted to say that, that Paul wants men in 2024 to not wear a hat during the church service, well, it's a different story when you go into your house, but we like rules and stuff, and there's nothing wrong with them, but when you sit down at the dinner table, you better take your hat off and pray, and then you can put it back. I mean, you know, so, um, but that's, that's you know. Well, but there's certain belong, things. We belong to the Missouri Senate and left because uh, my husband was confirmed and baptized in another Lutheran church, and he could not take communion in the Missouri Senate. Yeah. You can't. Oh, you have yeah. to be a member. So they, they practice what is called closed communion. Yeah. Uh, and super technically, I think the Roman church does and the Orthodox churches do, or, they, or the biggest, you know, the main part of them does. And that is, um, we look at that and we say, how offensive. But to be generous, they're saying, unless you believe what we believe about the Lord's Supper, 
If you take it wrongly, it could be detrimental to you. So we're trying to we're not trying to say we're better than you. We're trying to protect you from taking the Lord's Supper in the wrong way, right? So now there could be some people who would say who you know who could kind of be like David, who is this uncircumcised Philistine over there, right? <laughs> right? Because that's how our hearts work. Adam, you know, our old Adam in us is always wanting to do so. All right. Um, but so the, the Missouri Synod are on paper they practice closed communion. Now I, I knew a Missouri Synod pastor in uh, in Pennsylvania, and there was one Sunday I went to his service, and you're supposed to come up. You know, if you want a blessing, you just put your hands over. And I went up to the rail and I put my hands up over, and he's like, Come on. Because he knew me, but I didn't want him to, to not do what his denomination told him to do, right? So I just I said, No, it's okay, it's, it's fine, it's fine. You know, just give me a blessing, Sean. Um, so, yeah. All right, so here we are talking about favoritism and partiality. Uh, you, smelly man, and I, in one of the sources I read, talked about a guy who was preaching a sermon like this, and in the middle of, at the beginning of the service, this guy came in who was homeless, smelly, and even during the service, he took out, took out from his jacket this sandwich and started eating it, and, you know, slowly in the, in the resource, the guy said that people started moving away from him, and then the guy got up to preach, and he was preaching on this, and it turns out he'd hired this guy to be an actor. Oh. <laughs> I'm going to say, you could tell it was a setup. Right, it was a setup. It was a setup. Was right. set up. So there in verse 4, have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? So he sets it up. Uh, there's a certain kind of favoritism, there's a certain kind of partiality that Christians can be tempted to. And, it, and when you do this, you've got evil thoughts. And again, James, James does not have a spoonful of sugar to help the medicine go down, right? It is, it is full bore, just black coffee, no cream, no sugar, stout, right? What's, and then what's the... So he, he sets up this example and he says, here's the problem... And then he says, then he kind of gives the reason why it's a problem there in five. Why is, why is that kind of behavior a problem according to verse five? Well, because God chose those who are poor in the eyes of the world. Jesus come down he here. Rich. He did not go to the rich. Yeah, yeah. So again, this is, although the quote, the gospel isn't necessarily put forth in James like it is in Paul's letters. A gospel principle is here. Why do you treat people like that when God did not treat you like that? That's a gospel-centered application, right? James isn't just going to say, do this, do this, do this, do this, although he does say a lot of do this, but here's one of those things, and he says, God has chosen the people who are poor. Mm -hmm. And he could easily say, and that's you, right? Mm -hmm. And that's you. So it is a gospel-centered application of this text. Because um, <clears throat> uh, when it comes to God choosing the poor, if God owns the cattle of a thousand hills, he's probably the richest thing ever. He's the richest person ever. So for him to choose anybody, he's choosing somebody by uh, definition who is poorer than he is. But then there are other types of poverty. There's not just monetary poverty, there's personality poverty, there's uh, friend poverty, there's uh, mind poverty, you know, people with lower intellectual abilities. Um, so he says, listen, my beloved brothers, you, you know, here comes this scenario, you shouldn't act like this, this is evil action. Let me tell you why, because God has chosen the poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom. Mm -hmm. So if God has put his approval on uh, the poor, why are you disdaining the poor, right? It's like you said earlier. I forget the word you used for it. Did you say disgusting? Yeah. Yeah, well, it's certainly it's disgusting, right? Why do we... Uh, God has chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he has promised to those who love him. You know, in, in our country, uh, the poor very often are are also a different color than we are. So we have the black population in many places, 
-hmm. who are the poor. Mm -hmm. Not straight across, but yes. Right. True. And, and uh, there's a lot to be said about that. And the need for reconciliation. Absolutely. Absolutely. I Sometimes I get, when I watch the news and I see all this illegal coming into our country, and you can't help but be anger because they're coming in freely and they're oh. bringing everything. Oh, you mean this group that's coming in now under Biden? Yeah. Oh, that's but really <laughs> disgusting. Anyway, I was, I was doing my devotional one time and I said, my God, the very Bible that I study, God, come down and be with the poor. And yet, in my heart, I feel like I'm the most sinner at this because I, I resent those people coming in here. But then, maybe they're coming in here, some of them are coming in here to expecting a better life. But a yeah. lot of them, criminals, are coming in and our government are just letting them in. So I'm kind of... Yeah, it's, it's, it's a tough one. It's a heartbreaking. Uh, and it's heartbreaking. It is. When you think about it. Yeah. Yes. And yeah. if... Uh, the reason they are forced to come here is because of the... You know, the, the regimes that they're escaping. Venezuela is a perfect example right now. You know, but anyway, it's just heartbreaking. What what, what is the UN doing? What is the UN doing? <laughs> well, anyway. What about the word respect? Now, uh, we, we cannot con condemn anybody because they're poor. And they cannot come dressed in a suit or what you think is proper. So they come with the clothes they have. And still they respect the people who are surrounding you. But what if somebody shows no respect for a, a, a church that's in, in progress. And so if somebody just shows up and they are uh, just... Smokes. They're unruly. If they show up and they are unruly, then I think we've got good grounds biblically to say, friend, you know, I mean, pastorally you would say, are you drunk? I mean, not, you wouldn't say that, but right, there, there could be some weird reasons for this erratic behavior, right? But if you sort it out, you know, we, we do have, I think, a, a reason to, like, during the worship service to say, uh, we glad to be here, but it's time to be quiet right now, things like that, right? Yeah. Respect. Um, all right, so he says, has God not chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he has promised to those who love him? Um, can you think of some poor people that God chose in the Old Testament? Well, the poor, the rich, the poor woman that was looking for her koi. She was yeah, that's poor. one of that's one of uh, yeah, that's one of Jesus' um, parables. The woman who lost the coin. I'm thinking of the Old Testament. Boy, was uh, Abraham? Did well, he have no, not sure about Abraham, but he was. No, he wasn't poor. No, well, later, he didn't wind up poor, right? We don't, we don't know. This is a little bit of a stretch, so don't feel too bad. <laughs> uh, when God went to Egypt, which group of people did He pick? Mm -hmm. Oh, the slaves. The slaves, the slaves. <laughs> so, right? Yeah. In theory, the poor. Right. right. So, no, the poor. so theoretically. You know, right. that's, so that's one of the examples, you know. God chose the poor. When he showed up in Egypt, he did not pick the Egyptians. He picked their slaves, right? And that's also because he had picked Abraham way back and all that sort yeah. of stuff, right? Exactly. But that's an interesting example of God choosing the poor, right? Okay? Now, what, what are the... So, uh, I don't know that James is necessarily, and we talked about this in Sunday school, I don't know that James is necessarily railing against every single rich person. Because here, look at what happens in, in uh, 6 and 7. How does he describe the rich here? He says the rich, in this case, they're, they're, they're oppressing the church. Okay, What else are they doing? 
And slandering, slandering the, name. the noble name of Slandering the noble name of God, yeah. right? right? And they're also, before that, dragging, dragging, dragging them into court, all right? So again, as we talked about in Sunday school, I don't think that uh, the Bible is just against rich people as rich people. No. Rich people do have a certain set of temptations that poor people don't have, right? Um, but in this case, he says, he says, this rich people that are coming in and you're fawning all over them, aren't they the ones that are harassing you and taking you to court? And blaspheming the name of your God? Why are you fawning all over these people who don't like you or your God? Right? <laughs> oh boy. Tough stuff, right? And then he says, a failure to a failure by showing partialism or favoritism towards the rich. You're not fulfilling the law of scripture, which is what there in verse 8. Loving your neighbor as yourself. Loving your neighbor as yourself, right? Uh, that's the golden rule, right, that Jesus taught. Whatever you think, uh, however you would like people to treat you, you do the same to them. And again, you can get kind of pigeonholed and do that in a wrong way. Uh, probably it's better to say whatever is appropriate, however you would be appropriately treated, you treat the other person appropriately. So, for instance, if I had, if I just took the golden rule and said, Jesus tells me to treat others the way I want to be treated. Well, if I want to be punched in the face every day, there's something wrong with that, right? <laughs> and if I say, well, Jesus tells me to treat other people the way I want to be treated, I would like to be punched in the face every day, so I'm going to punch everybody else in the face all the day, right? So, you know, we can get, get a little bit out of whack with the golden rule. It's still the golden rule, and Jesus still says it. And we are still supposed to love our neighbor as ourselves. But, but part of that is, you know, so for instance, when I'm in the hospital, I'm not interested that people come and see me. I could care less, right? But if I take that and say, when other people are in the hospital, well, I don't want to be bothered, then they don't want to be bothered. Well, that's not, that's a misapplication of the golden rule, right? Okay. So again, we're back to asking God for wisdom and how to do these things, right? Okay, so he says, you shall love your neighbors yourself, you're doing well, but if you show partiality, you're committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. Okay, so showing favoritism toward the rich just because they're rich, and it's made even more ludicrous because these rich were oppressing them and blaspheming their God, and they still would want to... James is saying they would still want to fawn after them. We don't get a chance to do that when the Grammys come on or when the Oscars come on, do we? We don't watch the red carpet and listen to them lecture us about all sorts of stuff. Okay, I'm, I'm off my soapbox here. <laughs> all right, so the next little section here. Uh, 10 to 13, what's the topic? Or what could the topic be? I know that some of your chapters split it in a different place. So he said, here's a real specific taste case showing favoritism. Here's why you don't do it, because God loves the poor. He's chosen the poor to inherit the kingdom. Poor in this world, rich in the next, okay? So what happens there in 12 to 13? Isn't he saying if you, if you break any law, you, you're, you're a lawbreaker? Doesn't, there's no degree of breaking the law. Okay, yeah. And then we talked, we, we touched on this a little bit in Sunday school uh, the other day as well. Um, <clears throat> Whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. For he who said, okay, so he says, if you, you know, pick a, pick a, pick a biblical law, if you break one of it, you've broken them all. Now, why does he say that there? What's the reason there in 11? You, if you break one law, it's you, not an either or. It's not an either or because the same God who said don't do X is also the same God who said do do Y. That's what he's getting at. For he who said, verse 11. So verse 10 he says, if you keep the whole law but fail at one point, you're guilty of breaking it all. Why? 
because God gave the law, mm-hmm. right? So again, we talked about in Sunday school on Sunday, sometimes we think of the Ten Commandments, right? And it's just easy for us. Um, the first table of the law, the first four commandments, and again, depending on your tradition, they'll, stri- they'll divide it up different, but the point's the same. The first four table of the law, we call it, talks about our relationship to God, how we live with God, how we treat God. Commandments 5 to 10 are how we treat neighbor. Others. So if you break commandment number 9 to not lie, not only are you not loving your neighbor, you're also not loving God. Why? Because God gave commandment 9. So if you if you decide to lie there in in commandment nine, um, you're actually breaking commandment one, right? Uh, the things with about gods is that we have an, a proclivity to obey them, right? Except for the true God, right? But uh, so God says, don't have any other gods. Don't worship the other gods. Now, in, in when, the, when that was given back in Exodus, you know, when God was giving that, what were the people at, at, at Exodus at Mount Sinai? While he was in the middle of giving Moses all the law, what was happening down at the bottom of the mountain? They were worshiping. They had a calf. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I mean, it's just, and so that explains why when he, Moses comes down, he's like, what? We just got this and you already broke it. It was, <laughs> well, they didn't just get it, right? The, 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 the principle of the law of God is that when Adam was in the garden, God gave him a command, right? So Adam is a representative of all humanity is obligated to, to obey God, okay? Now, when we get to Exodus, the law becomes way more explicit, right? What, what was one command in the garden has now become um, it, to its fullest, right? Okay. What so if you break one, one law... The, we break one of law, the biggest thanks be to God What's for that? Jesus. If we break one law, we break them all. So because of Jesus, that's the only reason why I feel safe. <laughs> and that's why it's good that He kept all the law for where you and I fail, right? One of the biggest concerns in this country right now is the migration thing about showing pity to the people who are looking. To, to, to better themselves. Okay. Uh, you sit at the supper table and you make a discussion about it, the good and the... There are things such as laws I know that are necessary. But when you see these people piling up behind this barbed wire over there and more coming... <laughs> uh, yeah. It's you tough. Ha- you have to abide by the laws. It's tough. We we yeah, and we are you know, the the law in our country is not the president. The law in our country is the constitution, and it lays out certain powers and stuff. And we do have laws on our books, and yeah, it's a mess. It's an absolute mess. It's an absolute mess. Um, unfortunately, uh, our government as a whole does not have the scriptures norming its behavior, right? It doesn't. It should. Every political leader should obey the scriptures, no matter what. You know, that's just how it works. But, but it is tough. It is tough. We do have laws, and the laws say you're not allowed to be in our house without coming through the front door. Right? Uh, so it would be interesting if James were written today what he might say about it, right? All right, so... So here's the section. Um, you break one law, you've broken them all. That's why it's such good news that Jesus overcame where Adam failed. He overcomes where we fail. He overcomes where the church that James is writing to fails. Okay. Um, so speak and act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. So one of the commentaries I read said it this way. Um, I forget where I wrote it down. That mercy triumphs in the law, but not over the law. Okay? 
Um, we are seeking to be under the guidance and tutelage and instruction of the Scripture. So mercy within that, under that umbrella would triumph, but it doesn't, mercy can't come along and say, well, you shouldn't do any of these things. Does that make sense? Um, yeah. So I, I wish I'd have taken better note there. All right, but we've got to keep moving because we're not going to get to the end. All right, so the last section, last section is faith and works. And this is a, uh, boy, if you talk about Book of James, uh, hot spots where people do a lot of debating, it's this. This is the, this is the section. So James is going to investigate the concept of faith's relationship to works or deeds, okay? And what's his basic take? If you were to boil it down to about half a sentence, what's James's take here on faith and works? Can't do one without the other. <laughs> okay. Faith without works is dead. That's how it ends there, right? Uh, so he does four test cases. That's what Dr. Doriani calls it, four test cases. So he sets it up and he says, what good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? Test case number one is what? 15, 16, oh. and 17. Oh. No, oh. if you, if you see somebody poor or hungry and you say, oh, goodbye and hope you get food or <laughs> clothing okay. along the way, but I ain't going to do it. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, if brother or, well... Okay, is it somebody? Well, is okay. it random person? No, no, brother. Or That's sister. interesting, right? Yeah, yeah. So James limits it here to who? People of faith. Your brothers and sisters in the church. Now, is it wrong? You know, would I use this verse to try to say we should make sure that migrants sitting outside, or, you know, who have no. just come into the border and are waiting, and it's two degrees that we should. Uh, <clears throat> dump ice water on them as well? No, right? But James technically says if you have a brother or a sister who's in need, right? And he's not talking about bloodline, he's talking about faith line, right? Mm -hmm. Although um, there is a concept, and it's maybe in one of the Timothys or something later, that says if, a, if, a, if a, somebody doesn't provide for their family, they're worse than an unbeliever. So there is a there is a concept that you know we are obligated to our physical families, but the scriptures place a priority on our spiritual family, right? Uh, one of the one of the teachings of Jesus, he says, if you give a little one a cup of water in my name, you have done them good. And we always just think that means giving water out, but if you look at it, he's talking about one of his disciples. We misuse that a little bit in, in the history. All right. So he says, if you have a brother or sister <coughs> who comes in, maybe from the earlier in the chapter, right? Remember what the issue was earlier? Somebody came in who wasn't clothed well, mm -hmm. right? And you just say to them, hey, go in peace. Be warm and filled. I'm busy. <laughs> uh, I'm going to the buffet for the third time today. <laughs> I don't have time. But I certainly will pray for you that God sends someone along who has third buffet of the day kind of money to help you. Right? That's a ludicrous example, right? That's what Paul, that's what James is saying, right? So if you have the kind of faith, this is what James is saying, that would see a brother or sister poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and you say, Oh, I sure hope somebody helps you. Ow, I'm sitting in my wallet and it is so thick because I got paid and I got it all in ones. Right? If you call that faith, it's not real faith. That's what, that's what this test case is saying. Okay? That doesn't mean there aren't extenuating circumstances. So for instance... If you see the same brother or sister poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and you've helped them 17 times, and we're on time number 18, then we might say, maybe there's more at work here, right? We don't want to enable either. 
right? Would you say it's hard to be a Christian? Absolutely. I'll just, uh, that's a simple answer, yes. It is hard, <laughs> it is hard. Okay, test case number two. Uh, 18 to 20, what's the topic there? One person has faith and another one has the uh, capacity to have deeds, but they don't put them together. Okay, yeah. So each of these test cases, there in 15 he says, if a brother has this, and so you know it's one of these test cases because he says, so, so he says, here's the scenario, here's where the one who claims they're having faith isn't producing good works. And then in 17, so also uh, faith by itself, it does not have works, is dead. Mm -hmm. So then he starts his next text, test case. Someone will say, I have faith, you have faith and I have works. And then he expounds it a little bit, and then he says there in 20, do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? So that's how, I, that's how Dr. Doriani would say these are test cases. Because he says, here's, this, here's the principle, faith without works is dead, here's the example, and also faith without works is dead. That's how he sets these test cases up, okay? So this one is, uh, somebody says, well, you've got faith and I've got works. Well, show me your faith apart from works and I'll show you my faith by what I do. You believe that God is one, you do well, even the demons believe and shudder. <laughs> now, is a demon going to do a good work of God? No. no, but they have this intellectual knowledge that God exists. We've been seeing that when Jesus is preaching to the demons, right? Mm -hmm. you Holy One of God, have you come to destroy us, right? So demons have, uh, and we've talked about it, uh, true faith has knowledge, assent, and trust, right? Is that what it is? Yeah. Knowledge, assent, and trust. So knowledge is there's a God. Assent is, well, I, I'm convinced that it is the fact that there is a God. But trust is, I trust in this God who I know exists. Okay? So James is saying there's a demonic faith where somebody could say, well, I've got this intellectual knowledge. Right? Bible scholars who are atheists say, well, the Bible does teach that God exists. But there's no God. Right? Those are the not kind of right Bible scholars you need to be reading and listen to, but there are probably many that are like that. All right? So, the first test, compassion for a brother or sister who's in need. The second test is this just simple intellectual assent, right? What's the third test? 21 to 24. Abraham. Abraham. Okay. And what's the, what does James marshal as the proof that Abraham had a living, working faith? He was willing to sacrifice his son. He's willing to sacrifice his son. He was obedient. He was obedient. So, uh, it's another place in, in Paul where he talks about the faith of obedience, or faith striving towards obedience. Um, true faith will always strive towards obedience to God. True faith, the posture of true faith will never say, eh, you know, I'm on the cafeteria plan, so I'll choose uh, commandments 2, 5, and 6. <laughs> All right? True faith doesn't do that. True faith says, this is God's law. He knows the way. Ultimately, it is the law of liberty because when I am able to do what he says, I'm free in actually who I was created to be, right? Free for obedience now. We think of freedom in America as just, I can do what I want. Well, the biblical version of freedom is that once you've been freed from your sin, you're free to obey God, and that's true freedom, okay? All right, so he's marshalling Abraham, and if you were standing around, and you'd say, look at that guy over there, he's willing to, to sacrifice his son, us moderns would say, oh, that's terrible. Well, what's going on with Abraham willing to sacrifice his son? That's a picture of God sacrificing his son. the lamb, right? Mm -hmm. And we think, well, this is a Abraham's a religious nut job. But he, 
but we would, I mean, he, he wasn't, right? But if you were against the faith, you'd say, this is crazy, because he's willing to uh, sacrifice his son. And we would say, that's how we knew he had faith. <laughs> right? He didn't just say, I believe in God, and God, God called me out of Ur of the Chaldees, and he said, go where I tell you to go and do what I tell you to do. And then when the rubber hits the road, he's there with the knife, right? Now the book of Hebrews tells us what? About if, if the Lord had not stayed Abraham's hand. What does the book of Hebrews tell us about Isaac? That Abraham knew that God would raise him up anyway. Mm-hmm. Right? Now, if somebody comes and says, I'm going... If, <laughs> If Larry comes and says, I'm going to plunge a knife in my son's heart, I would say, don't do that. <laughs> right? As much as Larry's son is wonderful, his son is not Isaac, right? Because <laughs> remember, Isaac was the promised son through whom the promise would come, right? Mm-hmm. I'm sure your son's great, but he's no <laughs> Isaac, right? Just like we aren't Isaac, right? Okay? So if, if, if Larry comes and says, I believe God is telling me to plunge the knife in the heart of my son, I'd say, no, he's not. He's not, well, you could raise it. No, 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 that's not it, okay? Larry would not do that, but, all right. So he says, Abraham just didn't say, I believe God. He was, when the rubber meet, met the road, he had the knife in his hand. So if you were standing there and you were watching Abraham, you would say, that guy must really actually have faith because his hand's up with the knife, okay? That's the real kind of faith. And that's what he's getting at. Abraham, uh, in the script, uh, you see that his faith was active along with his works and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled. It says, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness and he was called a friend of God. Now, it's the belief that got him the, quote, righteous status before God. But that belief also produced him his belief coming out of his hands. Does that make sense? Okay. Can you imagine that little boy laying there and his father ready to kill him? <laughs> yeah. uh, Unbelievable. You know, he could, he could, uh, he could have easily said, <clears throat> "Dad, you, you uh, my half brother Ishmael, you sent him away, and now you're killing me, and the promise is coming through me, right?" You could, I mean, you could imagine that. Mm-hmm. But God in His providence worked it all out, right? All right, so. Uh, then the last test case is with Rahab. So how did she, uh, how did she, if you were watching Rahab and her actions, how would you know that she had faith in Yahweh? She sent these people out the back door, basically. I mean, it wasn't the back door. <laughs> Yahweh's people came around. She believed that, that they were who they said they were. She believed in their God. And she hit him, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't simply, if you would have asked her, Rahab, do you believe in Yahweh, the God who brought all his poor people out of Egypt? She would say yes. And then if you watched her and how she acted on that, you would say, I'm convinced, mm-hmm. right? Same way with Abraham. Abraham, do you believe in Yahweh who promised you the son? Yes. And then if you watched him, you would say, yes, his faith is genuine because he's willing to sacrifice his son. If you look at a demon and you would say, do you believe in God? They would say, absolutely I do. Well, then why don't you obey him? Well, because he's God and I hate him. (laughs) Well, your faith is not genuine, Mr. Demon. If you see somebody who comes into church and they say, Oh, I'm sorry you don't have any food today. Um, Excuse me, I'm too busy counting my money. Is that person's faith genuine? No, No, that's what James says. So what it gets down to, and uh, we have managed to avoid it here, which is a massive thing that many books are written over, um, and I found this illustration today, that faith, uh, this is uh, faith, equals justification plus works. That's what I believe the scriptures teach. That is the reformed way of looking at it. Faith equals justification plus works. So when, you, when the Lord 
gives you a heart of flesh in place of your heart of stone, you are justified and you will produce works. That's the Reformed way of looking at it. Um, now, your Catholic friends and probably Eastern Orthodox friends are number two there. Faith plus their works produces justification. That's not the way we look at it at all. We say, when God grants you the gift of faith, you are justified and works follow. Period. Mm-hmm. Okay? And then uh, the Catholic version is, if you've got faith and you add your works to it, then you will be justified. And then the other version is faith equals justification minus works. This is what Paul. This is what James is getting at. Okay, James is saying that's not how it works at all. If you have true faith, you will have works. That's what James is saying. Okay, um, and I will say, uh, you know, there's a thousand. I mean, th- lots of books have been written about. Some people see a tension between James and Paul here, and there's a Massive discussion. I don't see any tension. Paul is getting at, when he says, um, when he presents the doctrine of justification, he's getting at people who say uh, that they are legalists. You know, they are gonna, they've convinced themselves they're going to follow all the 613 laws down to the T, and then God's going to accept them. Well, after Adam in the garden, that, that can't work anymore. So Paul is getting at legalists. And James is getting at nominalists. Okay? Paul is getting at people who say, well, I trust in Jesus, but I also need to add circumcision. I need to add to it. Right? I need to follow this law. James is getting at people who say, well, I have faith. Well, do you ever go to church? Nope. Do you ever read your Bible? Nope. Do you ever fed anybody? Nope. <laughs> James is pushing back against nominalists who just say, well, I'm a Christian in name only. I don't actually believe, and I don't actually do any of the things that a Christian does. James is getting at the person who says, I am a member of the Bears football team. (laughs) Oh, you are? How long have you been? Ah, way back. A long time ago, I became a member of the Bears football team. Well, and you hold up the almond-shaped ball and a round-shaped ball that are both called footballs, right? American football and soccer. soccer. You say, uh, you're on the Bears. Well, which one of these do you use? I don't know. I've never touched either of them. <laughs> have you ever been to practice? No. Do you, have you even been to the training facility? No. Have you ever played a game? No. That's what James is pushing against, right? James is saying, if you feel like you've got faith, you're going to go to some of the practices, you're going to wear the jersey, you're going to know the plays, you're going to do some of the things, right? That's what James is pushing against. Somebody who says, well, I just said a prayer once 45 years ago and nothing ever changed in my life, right? That's what James is pushing back against. What Paul is pushing back against is, well, you, you, need, you got Jesus, and you got faith, and that's great, but you also need to add a little bit of circumcision in there. <laughs> they're, they're, they're pushing back against the same things. So, um, I'll just share with you. So, James says, if you've got a faith that, that doesn't produce any works, that's not genuine faith. That's where James lands, okay? Now, Paul says here in Titus, um, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, even. And what does it do there in verse 12? It trains us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. So when Paul is writing here, he says, salvation has appeared. Jew and Gentile can have it. Rich and poor can have it. But what does it do? Grace trains us to do what? What? To basically live how God would have us to live, to produce these yeah. works, right? That's what Titus 2 is saying. Grace actually, the grace of God, the mercy and grace of God actually trains us to choke out our sin, to want to make, to to strive to live into God's commands, okay? Um, Waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior. Verse 14, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for what? Good Good works. Good works. 
So Paul says, genuine faith. If you are a person of genuine faith, you will have good works. Okay. He also says it here in uh, Ephesians 2. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for what? Good works. Good works. So you have been saved. I'll default to Luther here again. Um, when it comes down to good works, you don't need your good works because you can't be saved by them. God doesn't need your good works because he's the original good worker. Who needs your good works according to Luther? Your neighbor does, right? That's why we do good works, all right? So I think at the end of the day, there's no uh, ultimate uh, contradiction between Paul and James because they're addressing two different groups of people and they both land in the same thing, that a genuine faith will produce works, okay? Uh, but there's a lot of controversy in this. And uh, so far, we sidestepped it all today, so I'm very glad. <laughs> all right. Uh, thoughts or questions? Did you find anything particularly challenging about this? Right. I will not uh, push to expose you too I, much. Oh, I do love your neighbors yourself. I, mean, have a, I have a real neighbor that I just don't like. I mean, she's nice, but she just does things that, yeah. Well, the world, the flesh, and the devil would say, well, God didn't really mean that particular thing. Because God didn't know that. But I've been praying about right. it. And, okay. You know, it's like today, it's garbage day, but she doesn't. She likes to sleep late, so she puts her garbage in our neighbor's door. So they take it down. It, it just, I see that, and I go, but Is it hurting anybody? No. It's not, yeah. you know, my, my other neighbor's <laughs> being a good neighbor. Put it down, so... Yeah, that was good. my challenge. <laughs> uh, anybody else? The question of who is your neighbor? Mm -hmm. Who is your neighbor? Like the Samaritan. I'm sure. That comes up. It's whoever's in front of you who has a need. Right? All right. Let me pray for us. Uh, Father, we thank you again for uh, this challenge from our brother James. And our desire is not to just be hearers and sayers of the word, but also doers of the word. So, Father, work on us by your word and through your spirit. We thank you that the Lord Jesus did not transgress any of the commands, and he did it for our sake. Mm -hmm. So, Father, having been forgiven in him, uh, mold us and shape us so that we would grow up to be like our older brother Jesus. Um, Help us to not uh, treat our faith as something that's just on the shelf. Help us to practice it and, uh, and rest on the Lord Jesus Christ alone. We ask that you do the same for the folks that are normally with us uh, at the study and the folks that join us by video. We thank you for Jesus, and it's in his name we pray these things. Amen and amen. 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 All right. Thank you all.